you have to uh, uh, interpret. So what does in Alc in Alc in Alc uh, what does that mean anyway? Oh, okay. Thank you. Can't stand it when a banjo plays in another tongue. I guess you have to be a musician. But you won't have to be a musician to, to listen to this. They was these three Baptist deacons. Are, are you ready, Miss Janice? Three Baptist deacons. They was at the Christmas dinner, and they all died. And uh, now we don't believe Peter's at the gate, but I'm, you know, for, well, play along with me, will you? So Peter was at the gate, and he said, uh, uh, well, I can't let you in unless you got something, you know, to do with Christmas. The Christmas dinner, you died to Christmas dinner. You've got to have something to do with Christmas. So one of those deacons reached in his pocket, and he had a cigarette lighter. And he said, oh, I use this to light my candles. So he let him in. The other guy reached in his pocket, and he had his car keys. And he said, jingle bells. <laughs> so they let him in. And this last one, he's feeling all around. He couldn't find nothing but his wife's sunglasses. And he said, here they are. And he said, now I can understand how that cigarette lighter could, but I can understand how that, those jingle bells, but man, your wife's sunglasses ain't, is just not going to get you in unless you can explain something. He said, oh, they're carols. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Enough for that. I'm glad you're here. Good to see you this morning. I appreciate every one of you for coming. Good to see uh, folks that haven't been here for a while. We're, we're glad the Corduskies are here. And, yeah. And the glad that the Hoys are here from down in North Carolina. I'm, I'm glad Shirley came with me this morning. Amen. Just, just a blessing to have you in church. Amen. So it's preaching time. Are you ready? Yeah. In the book of, uh, what am I looking for? Second Corinthians. In the book of Second Corinthians, chapter number 9. Boy, that scared me. I thought I'd left that at home. <laughs> Second, I'm almost 70, folks. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter number 9. Let's look at verse number 10. We'll start there. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God for the administration of this service, not only supplieth the one of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men and by their prayer for you. So, so, so far, they, they've said, he's, Paul's saying, thank you for being a cheerful giver, okay? By their prayer for you, which long after you, for the exceeding grace of God in you. We thank you for you being a cheerful giver. But look at verse number 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Yeah. Yeah. Would you agree with me this morning? that the greatest Christmas gift that ever was given was when God gave His only begotten Amen. Son. Amen. Unspeakable gift. Yeah. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. I want to preach today about the unspeakable gift 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you this morning for a privilege to pray. Lord, we acknowledge, Father, that you own it all. And we thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to breathe part of it. Father, to sustain our body and the food on our table. Lord, we thank you for your blessings on our life. Father, we, uh, like Philip, we're unworthy, Lord. But God, you said for us to do it, and we're going to do it, Lord willing. I pray you'd give uh, our uh, listeners uh, uh, attentive ears, Father, that they could hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to talk first of all about the, the motive of Christmas, the reason that God gave His only begotten Son, the perfect motive for the priceless gift is love. Now we desire to bestow our love on somebody that is uh, worthy of our love because they have done something for us. The nursery rhyme, Mary Had a Little Lamb, has a, a heretical verse for the last verse. It says the reason that the Lamb loved Mary was because Mary loved the Lamb. I don't know whether you remember that uh, as far, but, but what I'm saying is that we want to bestow our love on someone we uh, deem worthy of our love. Yeah. But this book teaches me yeah. that right. God Amen. commended His love Amen. toward us yeah. right. and that while we were yet sinners, yeah. when we were unworthy of God loving us, yeah. He loved us. Uh, the love of God is uh, uh, just uh, something that we could... Never be able to fathom. I don't believe that man could ever understand the love of God. I don't believe we could ever know it. It's unknowable by human means until the incarnation came. And then when we understand that God himself wrapped himself in human flesh and came down here. Amen. To to live among us uh, and we could behold His glory and we could see what God is really like. No unsaved person that I've ever talked to knows what God is really like. Every one of them knows of a God that will cause them to go to judgment one day. Every one of them thinks that they have a God that needs them pressed. But I'm telling you, uh, the greatest motive uh, uh, that every world knew was God loved me when I was unimpressible. No test of love greater than that you would lay down your life. I mean, what else could we do? We find all these faults with God and everybody complaining about what, what God hasn't done and what He needs to do to satisfy them. But I'm telling you uh, that God gave the greatest thing He could give when He gave His life. Uh, uh, many have been caught up uh, in, the, in the idea that, that uh, uh, God needs to do something. God's already done something, my friend. The motive, the greatest motive for the priceless gift is that God loved us. Now you know people will die. I think in the heat of the moment somebody might give their life. Would you agree with that? I mean we read and, and remember that in Vietnam and, and uh, Korea and World War II, even Afghanistan, we, we read about a soldier uh, just throwing his body on a grenade to give his life for uh, uh, somebody else. We read about firefighters uh, that will go into a burning building and and they will uh, uh, give their life to rescue somebody. I don't know how all there is to know about it, but according according to history and according to story, in that United Airlines flight number 93, that crashed up there in Pennsylvania. Those, you remember when that last telephone conversation, that old boy said, let's roll. He said, they're not going to take out our president. We're going to put this plane on the ground before they ever get to Washington. Yeah. Now, what I'm saying is that's the heat of the moment thing. Yeah. 
And I might do that. If somebody threw a grenade in here, I might fall on it to save this church. But I might go out that window. You understand what I'm talking about? If I got an opportunity to think, I guarantee you I'm going out that window. It's everybody for himself. And and so uh, uh, when I'm talking about the motive of God, God knew what it was. It wasn't something he did in the heat of the moment, uh, but it was something that was determined before the foundation of the world. God knew in Bethlehem's stable why he was there. We may do it in the heat of the moment, but God done it after years and years and years and multiplied billions of years ago. God thought about it and he said, I'll do it. The love of God is the greatest motive. Uh, The love of God was a predetermined, deliberate act. He loved you. And just between me and you, you're not worth loving. Amen. Amen. It's the only reason I love you is because God makes me. <laughs> he planned it in advance. Yeah, that's right. The Bible said the heavens declare the glory of God, but I think Calvary declares the love of God. Amen. Yeah. Amen. God loves, uh, not with a fleeting love, not with a just a spur of the moment thing like a Hollywood romance that starts in September and, or May and ends in September. But God loves us supremely in that He could do no more than to give His life in our place. God loves us ardently in that uh, many waters can't quench the love of God. I'm kind of glad I'm a Baptist. I'm glad to know that God loves me and is going to continue to love me. Perfect love that casts out all of my fears. That God loves me and said, I not only gave my life for you, I'll see to it that you get to glory. Christmas is priceless gift is through the matchless love of God. Then let me say point number two, that, that the, the, the priceless gift that he gave was his only begotten son. Amen. Greek, look for you Greek students, monogenesis is the word that's there. Can we take that apart? Mono means what? One, right? Genesis means what? Generate, right? He is the monogen. He's the only one that was ever begotten of God. Amen. The, Jesus Christ uh, is the only one that was ever begotten of God. Uh, self-explanatory, but He's the only one that's capable of redeeming you and I. Amen. Nobody else could do it. They may want to do it. I believe my mama loved me. I believe my mama would have did it if she could. But she couldn't. It wasn't up to her. The only one that could work the work of redemption was the only begotten Son of God. The only one that can work the work of revelation is the only begotten Son of God. I'm talking about the priceless gift. I'm talking about when the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and the Bible said uh, 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 he exhibited a glory. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, the only one that God ever generated. I, I cannot understand how God could love me more than he loved Jesus. Can you grasp that? Do you hear what this preacher just said? God loved you more than he loved Jesus. There are some things that I can understand. Romans chapter 8 verse 32, I cannot understand. It says that God spared not His only Son, but delivered Him up for us all. He loved me more than He loved Jesus. I can't grasp that. I can understand why He didn't spare the angels that sinned. I don't have any problem with that. I can understand why he did not spare the antediluvian world but washed them all away. I can understand uh, uh, why that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah for the wickedness of those cities. But I cannot understand how God would not spare his only begotten son. His own son. Possessor of his own nature. Amen. 
He did not spare as an act of mercy, but he spared, uh, as, uh, but he gave as an act of duty. He inflicted upon Jesus Christ the punishment that I deserve. Amen. Boy, that makes me feel about that time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, do you understand yeah. wicked sinner? Now, I don't know where they are, but I'm sure there's one or two in here. <laughs> do you understand that God put on his only begotten Son right. yeah. the sins of your soul? Right. All of your lying, stealing, cheating, adultery, murder, you name it, God put it all on Jesus just so that you could go to heaven. I'm talking about the gift of God. No wonder Paul said unspeakable gift. He died on that cross. He didn't die as a martyr. He didn't die as an example. He didn't die as a teacher, but he died as a substitute. God pulled me out and put him in my place and I should have been crucified but God's only begotten son. Well, glory. I mean, that, that, ought, to, that ought to bring somebody out of their seat when you realize that God so loved you that he gave that priceless gift. He did not come to condemn the world but he came to save the world. There was a lady in John Chapter 8, and I use that kind of uh, 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 sparsely a lady that was brought in that was taken in the very act of adultery. Yeah. Now probably there was a man involved too. Yeah, amen. He wasn't brought. Yeah. Just a woman was brought. Uh-huh. right? And, and they brought her in there and they said, this woman was caught in the act. Uh, and, and Moses' law said, that you ought to stone her. What do you say? (laughs) Amen. According to the law of God, I ought to go to hell. But what does Jesus say? Amen. Amen. You know, I won't repeat the story, though I can tell it to you about him stooping down and writing in the sand and about their being convicted by their conscience, starting with the smartest one, starting with the eldest one, starting with the biggest one, starting with the greatest reputation. They all filed out. And left just him and her standing there. (laughs) Jesus said, woman, where's your accusers? There's a bunch of them a while ago, wasn't there? Amen. We'd drag you on the carpet of this church. There'd be plenty of people, amen, that would accuse you. Woman, where are your accusers? Ain't got any. Yeah. Neither Amen. do I can yeah. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? Yeah. Go and sin no more. Yeah. Amen. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to save you. I didn't come uh, to judge the world. I came uh, to save the world. Yeah. Uh, but you know what? The, the sad fact is that this priceless gift with this unspeakable motive, uh, there was no room for him when he came. The world did not welcome him. In fact, he was consigned to a stable, consigned to a manger, because the Bible says there was no room at the end. Amen. Do you have room for Jesus today? It didn't necessarily say they hated him. It said they didn't have room for him. I mean, I got my Xbox, and I got my video games, and I got my Facebook, and I got all of these things that occupy Christmas. There is no room for Jesus. Preach on, preacher. The world did not welcome this priceless gift, but his first night was consigned to be spent in that manger. I'm talking about the priceless love. I'm talking about the priceless gift. But let me tell you this. There is a precise requirement. The Bible said Jesus is the light, the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The Bible said he was in the world. The world was made by him and the world knew him not. And he came to his own and his own received him not. But here's the requirement. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. There is a requirement. 
Yeah. Amen. You can't get in without Jesus. Amen. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, the Bible said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You remember that? So, of course, it's talking about a church, but we use it many times of people's heart that Jesus is there just knocking at the door. But the latch is on the inside. The requirement is that you've got to open the door. Nobody can force you to open the door. The preacher can't make you get saved. Dad and mom can't make you get saved. Uh, your son or daughter can't make you get saved. It's up to you to open that door. Uh, and if we will open that door, uh, uh, in, indeed men err from the truth. Uh, and uh, uh, they, they, they get out in the world and I know that. We're born sinners. We don't have to become a sinner. We're born with a sin nature. That there queer down there at Charleston told me, he said, I was born that way. And I said, then you need to be born again is what you need. Think about that for a minute. Let that soak in. We're all born with the capability. We're born with the capability to become an Adolf Hitler or Fidel Castro or a... Obama, well, I don't even what that dude's name is. I don't particularly like him. Yeah. Osama, Obama, no. Oh, well. But we're all born with that evil nature that's capable, amen, of doing anything. Amen. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. Revelation chapter 3, he said, I stand at the door and knock, and I see that the repentant heart will not lock its door. Amen. But will say, Jesus, come into my heart. Live in my heart. Now he recognizes the right of the one that lives in the house to open and shut the door. Jesus recognizes that. Amen. He knows uh, uh, that you have the right to either exclude him or include him. He never forces. He just stands at the door and knocks. Precise requirement that we receive him, that we open the door. The Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And, and Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Today, if you hear his voice, Harden not your heart. There's another example that I don't think I've ever heard people preach about Jesus being at the door. How many of you, you can lift your hands on this. How many of you heard that Revelation 3.20 that Jesus stands at the door and knocks? Okay, turn with me to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. I'm saying there's another time that he stands at the door. Let's look. At, well, we'll start at verse number seven. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Yeah. Now you see the Savior is standing. You understand what, do you understand what I'm Amen. saying? Yeah. But this book also teaches the judge yeah, right. is right there at the door. Amen. We don't know when he's coming. But I know that when that rapture trumpet sounds, you are shut out, man. Yeah. And the only time you'll get to see Jesus is not as a Savior, but as a judge, a very judge that will make you give account for the very thing that you think you have to give account for. Amen. The very thing that you'd want me to do, you're required to do when you stand Amen. before the judge. Now, uh, Uh, how many of you got these uh, uh, Christmas emails? 
from Best Buy and Sears and Wards and Pennies. And, you, know, you know what they would say? The offer expires soon. Now you've got an offer this morning of eternal life. God has opened the door of utterance to me to preach to you about this priceless motive, this priceless gift, this precise requirement. Uh, uh, But I I urge you now that you need to get on while they're getting on is good because the offer will soon expire. There used to be a group here years ago, probably close to 40 now, they called the Calvarymen. Yeah. And the Calvarymen, they, they had a, a cook. Was that his name? Connor Cook. And, and uh, he, he was uh, instrumental. I don't know that he wrote it, probably didn't. But he was certainly instrumental in the ticket song. Yeah. And he was talking, you know, about this train and said, if you've got a ticket, you can ride. You ain't got no ticket. You can't ride. Y'all, anybody remember that song? Amen. Amen. And he'd go down in the, in the congregation and he'd say, you got a ticket, man. Yeah. You got a ticket, you can ride. Yeah. Philip, you're supposed to wake up and hold that ticket up. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I got a ticket. Amen. Amen. You got a ticket, man. Amen. Let me see your ticket. All right. Yeah. You got a ticket, don't be embarrassed about your ticket. Amen. If you've got a ticket, say, here, Mr. Conductor, i got a ticket. Amen. Hold it up. I've got a ticket to glory. I'm saying today, you ain't got no ticket. You can't ride. Amen. I hear that train coming. It's coming around the curve. Puffing and a huffing and a strain and every nerve get on board. Well, that's another day. There is a priceless love. There is a a priceless gift. There is a precise requirement. And then let me close with this. There is a promised reward. Amen. Our labor is not in vain. You think, man, you drove up Witcher Creek for 30 some years. You preached to the same people. Some of them would listen. Some of them wouldn't listen. And you think you just wait. Our labor is not in vain. God opens the door. And whatever God opens, you use that opportunity that you have. He's entrusted us with the care of the gospel to go tell other people that Jesus saves. There are opportunities. We may be the one that plants. We may be the one that waters. We may be the one that has a harvest time. But God will never forget your labor of love. And one day, you'll be rewarded. If you see something needs done, do it. Amen. We will be rewarded according to our labor, not our criticism. If we wanted to find somebody that could point out things that needed to be done, hey man, everybody here can point them out. Miss that place right there. Amen. If it it had been me, I'd have done it this way. Well, why don't you do it? Am I mean? I appreciate Brother Richie. Just about every Sunday, you'll see him out there sweeping on that sidewalk. Yeah. You ever notice it? Amen. You, uh, nobody knows, nobody pays any attention. But the Lord pays attention. Yeah, right. Amen. Amen. He wants, when people come in here, He wants the church building to look good. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Are you I'm saying there is a promised reward. Well, we need somebody to be in the Christmas play. A whole lot of lines uh, 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 to memorize. Uh, old Bill says, I'll do it. Yeah, amen. You understand? Are, are you listening to yeah. me? Yeah. Amen. God sees all that stuff. You think, hey, nobody knows, but God knows. God promised uh, that our labor will not be in vain. Uh, We will be rewarded. Uh, If you see something that needs done, uh, you do it. Do you know that even crippled people uh, uh, can plant gardens? It's the seed that produces. 
One day in heaven, Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. One day in heaven, rewards are going to go around. And if I read my Bible right, there'll be some people at the head of the line that'll be said, hey, you're in the wrong place. You get back yonder. Some of you people that elbow and push your way to the front and are going to have your way regardless, you'll go to the back of the line. Amen. Amen. Abraham said, Lot, take your choice. I'll take what's left. Do you know there are, do you know there are uh, uh, preachers that wouldn't spit on Esther Baptist Church? Their nose is so high, man, they couldn't come up one of these hollers in West Virginia. If they couldn't have something in New York City, they don't want nothing. Amen. And that works on lower scales, too. Yeah, I mean, there are people that says, you need to be out in the valley. You up a collar, ain't nobody going to come up there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, amen. Ain't no good thing going to come out of Nazareth. I mean, no good thing going to come out of Dry Branch. <laughs> But your labor is not in vain. That's right. Amen. You just keep on. Amen. Yeah. Well, the first job I had in the coal mines was a rock breaker on a pan line. 32 inches of sand rock right in the middle of the coal seam. Coal miners know what I'm talking about. They would, they would drop one of them babies down in that pan line about as big as a Volkswagen. <clears throat> and it was my job to make it little dinner bucket sized. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and you know what I'd do? I'd take that 16 pound hammer and I'd hit that baby and it'd laugh at me. And I'd hit it and it'd laugh at me. And I'd hit it and it'd laugh at me. And I'd hit it and it'd laugh at me. And I'd hit it and it'd laugh at me. Am I telling it right, boys? Yeah. I'd hit it and I'd say, I want Adobe this. But, <laughs> I didn't, know, I didn't even know how to do be one. But directly, I'd see a crack in that baby. Yeah. Amen. So I just kept on pounding. Yeah. And kept on pounding. And Amen. kept on pounding. Yeah. I'd go home. I'd go home. My wife would meet me at the car. And she'd carry my dinner bucket. Amen. And I'd get over the steps of that trailer. And I, if I'm lying, I'm flying. I'd get over there at the steps of that trailer and I was so sore I couldn't go up. <laughs> Frontwards. I'd get yeah. up. And then you sorry sucker says preacher needs to work for a living. I know about working Amen. for a living. Amen. Amen. And I'd go to bed and I'd lay there in the bed and my wife say all night long I'd go. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but you know what? The rock got broke. Yeah, Amen. It didn't want to, yeah. but it did. Yeah. Yep. And I'm telling you that you just hang in there. Wherever you are and whatever corner God's placed you, you just try to brighten that corner. And one of these days, the sky's going to break open. Amen. Yeah. And He's going to come get us. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And the reward is sure. Amen. So I'm saying we've got a priceless gift. We've got an got a unspeakable motive. We've got a precise requirement. And then we've got a promised reward. Amen. Won't you come and go along? Hallelujah. We're going to sing the sweetest song ever played on the heart. Yes. Let's bow for prayer.